Welcome to Decision Analyst Insider Series webinar infusing marketing research and data science. My name is Christy Allen. I am the Marketing Director at Decision Analyst and the moderator today. Before I introduce our presenters, I have a few notes for everyone. In the handout section, there are some related case studies and papers. Also, please feel free to ask questions by typing in the chat box. We will attempt to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. If we don't answer your question during the webinar, someone will respond to your question within a day or two. Today's presenters are John Coleus, Senior Vice President of Advanced Analytics. John has nearly 30 years of experience in applying advanced metrics and models using data of many kinds. And Elizabeth Horn, Vice President. Beth has provided expertise in high-end analytics for decision analysts for more than 18 years, and she will be helping with the questions towards the end of the presentation. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to John. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on your location. Today we're going to talk about our fusion of marketing research and data science and, and how what the benefits and advantages of that are. We're talking about the disciplines and the fields of marketing research and data science and fusing together the functions and tools and methods that come with each field. And so uh, first we'll talk about the a conceptual overview of our topic for today, fusing marketing research and data science. And we'll immediately go into uh, some case studies, two different ones, one from the organic foods and beverage category and another uh, in uh, automotive or a high-tech truck um, survey and, and research that we will report on a little bit today. The industry categories, however, uh, for this kind of uh, topic are broad and we could talk about it in the service industries, we could talk about using these methods <clears throat> in uh, technology industries and financial and so forth, retail, and so we'll go through the case studies and talk about some conclusions and implications after going through the case studies. So with our conceptual overview, first of all, we all know uh, about this big data phenomenon that started uh, five to ten years ago and um, how uh, big data came with an explosion of promises. Uh, there's been an exponential growth in data with things like uh, that's even even grow, ex, uh, growing exponentially even within the last year with um, new smart homes, smart uh, cars, uh, wearable uh, devices like Fitbit and various things that are all producing massive amounts of data that are, are, are available. And of course, we have the social media data and, and available that's through online uh, activity and behaviors. So all of these uh, came with promises to dramatically improve business performance by modeling this data and building predictive models of, of this data. So we have the consumer insights, the survey-based insights that have been around for decades and have been somewhat overshadowed, I would say with uh, these explosion of, uh, of interest in, in, in big data and setting up the technologies and the platforms in order to capture it and the promises for the analysis of that big data. Um, one point we'd like to make, however, is that in big data, not everything is observable. There is the argument, of course, that um, activities, uh, comments in social media, behaviors at point of sale, all of that is is a function of attitudes and preferences, but the attitudes and preferences behind many of these things are not directly observable in big data. And, and so big data doesn't necessarily have everything. We find ourselves at the top of the data mountain looking for the unobservable in some cases. So one of the themes that we would like to, uh, to uh, present today is that um, this un these unobserved things, we have tools and methods in the survey research world that have been around for decades now that uh, are, have been designed to do good measurement of these unobserved things. So qualitative research, first of all, is a, the starting point with, with understanding what it is and that we should be measuring. And then quantitative research techniques that are objective, valid, reliable, 
scientific, have an experimental design behind them, and uh, have you know test and retest uh, validity. Um, have been around for a long time, writing good questionnaires. All of these have been well-tested techniques to measure unobserved things like attitudes and preferences and perceptions. And, um, and so we can measure these unobserved things and we can talk about the APP of survey, attitudes, preferences, and perceptions um, being measured that are not being measured in the big data world. And we'd like to talk about this in the context of a couple of sta case studies and how we can use this along with other sources of secondary data in order to um, create a win-win situation, something that um, some deliverables and insights that perhaps the marketing research function could not deliver by itself, nor the um, data science function could not deliver by itself. So in this first case study, we're uh, is in the, in the category of organic foods and beverages. And first of all, there's a problem with uh, that needs a solution. And the problem is, in this topic area, is that marketing research and data science are organizationally separated generally. There are some cases where they're coming together into a single department in, in corporate governance that we're seeing, but in general, there's this isolation and compartmentalization of the two functions. And so the solution would be to, to oppose it almost directly by talking about collaboration and cooperation between the marketing functions of marketing research and data science. And how fusion of methods and technologies and tools that would result from such collaboration would provide greater insights and greater deliverables to help business decision making. One of the key things that of course we get from data science are, are targeting. Who are my consumers and who and where are my consumers? In a survey world, we get information on that, but not, we don't take it down to the ground level uh, as we do in data science. So how can we do that and get, uh, you know, use the survey and take it down to the ground level as we do in data science? Well, in this case, we had a primary uh, research survey, the health and nutrition strategist that uh, decision analysts fielded for a number of years that had a long battery of questions about uh, consumption of foods and beverages and nutrition habits and attitudes about health and well-being. And from this survey, we pulled one question, a survey-based response variable, how often do you consume organic foods and beverages? And we uh, particularly took the very frequently category. Now, this, uh, I would argue, is an unobserved variable. We can, in point of sale data understand how much people consume of organic foods and beverages, but we don't know their self-perception of whether they consume frequently organic foods and beverages. And it may be that those who perceive themselves as frequent buyers of this and consumers of these uh, products uh, would be good upsell opportunities, would be good consumers to find. Uh, that may not be uh, as easily observed well, practically as to the point earlier, unobserved within the point of sale data. So um, that's the sense in which we're talking about an unobserved uh, data point in this case. And then we have external data the, from the American Consumer Survey. And the five-year summary data is available on public APIs. It can be downloaded. There are over 20,000 uh, variables available about socioeconomics, about housing characteristics, about employment, uh, occupation categories, a huge variety of things, population density, and so forth. A uh, number of consumers in the home and uh, poverty levels and very many things that are available, uh, all the way down to the block group level. And a block group, of, if you don't know, is about 12 to 1400 households on average. And there are uh, approach over 215,000 block groups in the U.S. So this is a, <clears throat> a very large data set that's available. And so in this particular case, what we did was we took the survey-based response variable and the block group census data and fused them together. And the, the method used to do this was to, to know the address of the survey respondents and from the address to, to therefore be able to find the block group that they live in and then to bring in all of the block group data. So envision here we have the survey data set and we're suddenly adding 
hundreds and even thousands of additional variables to the survey data set. And those, those additional variables are available for um, predictive modeling. And so uh, we use, borrowed techniques from data science uh, that are common in data science. Uh, the methodology is to randomly split the data and, and into a training data set and a validation data set. The training data set is used to train the model or, or uh, it's used for model development. The validation data is set aside, it's a holdout sample that is uh, used at the end of the modeling process to see how well the model is performing. And this is you know, a traditional common technique used in data science that we're now going to be using in the, in, with survey data because our survey provides the dependent variable for the modeling, the variable we're trying to explain, which is the uh, perceived consumption of organic foods and beverages. And this chart here, the lift curve on the right, is a common deliverable uh, in the data science world, and it, uh, the diagonal line, red line, basically represents if I were to go out there randomly to consumers, uh, what percentage of those higher consumers of organic food and beverages would I get to, and it would be a diagonal line because um, you, without a model behind it because uh, you basically get in the first 10 percent of your target that you targeted randomly you'd get 10 percent of the consumers the next 10 percent you get 10 percent more but with the predictive model we can get this bowed curve out to the left which basically says that we get some lift by using the model and we in this case we were two and a half times better than chance which is a common result in data science usually you could you know a good a decent model in data science can get two to three times chance in um, in predicting um, better than chance and so this is what we did we did the predictive modeling and from this predicted model we found who are my consumers uh, we found variables like uh, business what their occupation you know if they were employed in business management science the arts they were more likely to be consumers of organic foods and beverages. A uh, little bit older consumer is more likely, uh, higher education, higher income, and interesting, less likely to be Hispanic in this model, were all variables that were not just correlated with this uh, survey ver response uh, variable, but were actually predictive because um, the validation we did of the model was using a model that was trained on the training data and then we saw how well it predicted on the validation data. So these were the variables that were predictive of finding those consumers and who they are. So carrying this theme further about fusion of marketing research and data science, uh, we've shown now that we can talk about data fusion um, and we can talk about fusion of methodologies, borrowing tools from uh, writing a good questionnaire, uh, writing a good question from the marketing research world in, in a survey to using uh, predictive modeling from the data science world together. And now we're bringing in other technologies. We're fusing technologies and tools. And in this case, we have uh, an app that we created using open source tools. And here we're using the predictive model. We're going down to a retail site. Uh, this would be run in a browser and interacting with the internet and we've chosen the third retail site and a trade area distance of in drive time minutes of five miles. So what this is doing is in real time it's going out there and using the predictive model finding the block groups that are within that have uh, through queries to to Bing maps in this case finding those um, block groups that are within five miles of drive time of this retail site and um, and so th this is actually uh, being applied in real time the model and in a moment here we'll see a um, Google map that will pop up here it is and so uh, this is actually a Google map that is displayed within this app and you can zoom in just like you can in Google Maps and you can you know, the competitors are plotted on the map as well as the retail site for that we're of interest in the darker shaded block groups are those that are more likely to consume organic foods and beverages. This particular one here at po population of business management, science, and the arts, for example, was 72%, which is one of the drivers of higher consumption. And this, this second one you can see has a lower uh, management, science, and employment in 
lighter shading. So the drivers uh, that we found in the predictive model drive the likelihood of consuming organic foods and beverages as indicated by this heat map. And this is a, an actually a Google map that is used in an app that uh, in real time that we developed in order to apply data from the survey and the American Consumer Survey uh, external data that was fused in to do this predictive modeling. Here we're just seeing a display of the individual block groups in a histogram showing how many block groups were lower to higher um, predicted consumption, uh, the, the consumer, having consumers with lower to higher predicted consumption of organic foods and beverages. So here we just demonstrated that we can take this survey data and rather than just use this survey and do the survey and generate some insights by uh, uh, looking at the questions, maybe doing some multi multivariate analysis and key drivers, we're doing more. We're going into the, uh, we're using the data to build a predictive model to project to geographies around retail sites. So we've extended the marketing research application to something broader than what it would be typically be used for. Um, so we have other industry, a second case study in a different, totally different category, and this is in a automotive high-tech category. Uh, as we mentioned before, there's a lot of high-tech features that are going into vehicles these days. And um, in this case, we did a different kind of survey to demonstrate that it's not just a survey question, scale rating question that we can do this with, but we can do, in this case, a choice modeling or conjoint study where we're specifying attributes and levels of, an, of a new high-tech truck to test in a survey and we're using choice modeling or conjoint analysis to come up with individual level preferences for the different features. Same story then, fusing in other research data uh, from the American Consumer Survey and doing some predictive modeling and generating insights. So in this case, we, we actually then specified the attributes and levels and test. This is dis data is disguised somewhat. Um, so we don't reveal any of the details of the survey, but we tested a number of attributes, and here's some examples, cargo space, number of square foot feet cargo space in the vehicle, the hitching method, automatic or manual, so there's some high-tech features there, backup camera present or absent, and there were some other high-tech features that we did not, sh we're not displaying here. Power outlet, uh, capacity uh, of the vehicle, carrying capacity in pounds, these were all things that we tested and of course the price of the vehicle. And we did uh, predictive model, I mean we did choice modeling in this case to come up with um, an individual level, to come up with um, preferences. But the choice modeling in the survey was enabled by a choice task. Here's just a visual um, of, the, of a type of the way the screen uh, was organized where we had two different trucks with um, the attribute levels shown and the consumer was asked to pick their most preferred vehicle and how likely they were to choose to purchase that most preferred vehicle. That data produced as traditionally in the, in, marketing, in the marketing research field, data that we could use to do um, choice modeling with. And we were able, as we have developed techniques over the years in, in marketing research, to come up with individual level preferences. And here's an example of these preferences. Uh, again, the data has been changed a bit to protect uh, the, the, the proprietary nature of it. But respondent five here is more price sensitive. And um, the, you can see that because as the price goes up, their utility goes down quite a bit compared to the other respondent in the green bar. And the, this respondent values carrying capacity and you can see from the preferences that they have, they prefer at least 3,000 pounds of carrying capacity because the utility or preference goes up uh, sharply between 1,000 and 3,000 pounds. Uh, respondent seven then is less price sensitive. You can see the green bar is not as, uh, not as much reduction in utility or preference as the price goes up. And they, uh, they prefer cargo space or they they like cargo space more than the other respondent. Uh, so they place more weight on that. So, what, so this type of information from the marketing research world gives us an ability to target different consumers with different messaging because one consumer 
prefers one aspect of a vehicle and another might prefer, uh, prefer other aspects. So what does this have to do with data fusion? Well, what we did in this case was we um, took those preferences and we modeled those preferences as a function of the American Consumer Survey data that was fused into the survey uh, data set. So again, a very similar story. The, the marketing research survey provided new dependent variables, unobserved preferences that are not available in big data that we can use with data science and predictive modeling in order to develop a predictive model for targeting. And in this case, the lift curve uh, was not as dr uh, dramatically bowed to the left as in the case of organic foods and beverages. Not every category will give the same performance of predictive modeling. Uh, but if you look at the diagonal here, you can see that the predictions were about the sum of these uh, gold numbers, golden shaded blocks with numbers is about 55%, which is about uh, 1.8 times better than chance in this case. So. Um, after, and of course, we can, just like in the past, uh, the last case study, we can see what kind of variables were driving the best, the prediction success of this model, and it was things like occupation and education, income, and household size in this case. Uh, so those are the insights we can develop by looking at what is predictive, not just correlated, but what is predictive of these preferences. So once again, we have a survey that we can do, choice modeling, conjoint analysis is very common in the marketing research field. Uh, we can take that survey data and extend it and you do more with it. We could build, in this, as in this case, a targeting model based off of that survey. And um, so what are our conclusions from these two examples and from this topic in general? Um, data science can benefit from survey data by supplying additional variables that we can predict, that we can, that are dependent variables for predictive modeling. On the other hand, marketing research can also benefit because um, there are new applications of the surveys that we're not, uh, that typically we don't do in marketing research, that we can do by fusing together the methodologies of marketing research and data science. So, Fusion, really, we've talked as we've talked about it today, has multiple dimensions. <clears throat> it's not just fusion of data. Most people from years now have been talking about data fusion, primary and secondary data. We did that here. But it's not just fusion of data, it's fusion of technologies. In this case, we use the R language and dashboard software and Google Maps. Some of those tools are used much more frequently in the data science world where um, dashboards have been developed and dashboard uh, tools have been developed. We use them here. Fusion of methodologies. The well-designed survey re research questionnaire from the marketing research world plus the predictive modeling that, and the techniques that have been developed in data science to do very good predictive modeling were used together. And we have fusion of the marketing functions that these kinds of technologies and the ability to do this means that um, in order to accomplish this, we have to have the consumer insights and the database marketing and the big data analytics people talking to one another in order to take advantage of these opportunities for fusion with newer applications for marketing research and new dependent variables or predictive models that can be developed for the uh, big data for the, in the data science world. And uh, just a common comment, th this kind of data uh, fusion that we did was with the American Consumer Survey data. That's just one kind of data that can be brought in. There are other kinds, other data that could be brought in as long as there's a linking variable. And this is a subject we could talk about more, but GPS tracking can be used to know where people live. Uh, there can be um, online behavioral tracking of consumers who have opted in to have that kind of tracking done. Um, and then uh, th that on high, online, uh, those people can be sampled for doing a survey, for example, in order to generate in insight into unobservable variables among those consumers. And, the, and then their virtual location on the web can be used uh, as predictor variables as well. So there's a number of other ways that we can have fusion of the marketing functions. So, um, <clears throat> conclusion, I, I'd just like to 
end this up by saying that fusion leads to some powerful tools to, in, in my view, to improve business decision making. Um, implications would be that we can find consumers who have particular preferences or perceptions, where preferences, perceptions are unobserved in a lot of the point of sale data and the social um, listening data and so forth. Uh, they're unobserved, but we can observe them through survey instruments. We can find consumers in new ways. We can visualize and summarize retail trade areas, as we demonstrated here, based off of survey data in ways that we could not do unless without this kind of fusion of, of uh, methodologies. And we can improve targeting of advertising promotions, as we showed in the case of the, um, the conjoint study where we could understand consumer preferences and target them better. Um, and then we can optimize retail location strategies by understanding where the consumers are around retail sites based upon um, attitudes uh, that might be, or preferences may be more likely than attitudes, but possibly attitudes that might be related to neighborhood geographies, neighborhood geo uh, de demographics. And prediction, of course. Uh, the world of data science is all about prediction, and in here we can take prediction to a different level by predicting perceptions of consumers as opposed to point of sale, actual sales data, for example. So collaboration of marketing research with big data groups could benefit both entities. And so what we, we're trying to show today is that there is a win-win situation here. This is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for collaboration. And we hope to demonstrate some of that through this uh, through this. Uh, series of case studies that we talked about today. So I guess we might have some questions. Yes, yes we do. Uh, one of our questions is how did we obtain uh, the home addresses for the survey respondents? Right, so in this case we used a panel, uh, our decision analyst panel, where we had their addresses already. Um, there are, uh, and so that's, um, you know, um, so that is how we did it in this particular case. Um, there are uh, GPS tracking, there are companies that do GPS tracking and use the GPS tracking of people who have opted in to be tracked in order to find locations of consumers. Um, that's another possibility to do, to do, uh, to get address information, to, to get location information for fusing. And does this method uh, tend to work for every product category or industry? Yeah, that's a very good uh, point. And I would say no, it doesn't work as well in some industries as in others. We saw in the two case studies that the lift curve was better in one industry than the other. And we have applied it in, some, in, in, in industries where it really didn't produce a very good lift curve at all. And that would be cases where um, the the thing we're trying to predict just really isn't so much a function of, it might be more of a pervasive attitude that is changing over time, like um, early adoption is happening in certain categories as people's attitudes are changing and they're, they're, these people are everywhere in all demographic categories and it may not be predictive uh, based on that. But it might be predictive of some online uh, digital tracking data, for example. So it's an open question. Um, we can't go into it knowing that we're going to get a perfect predictive model uh, until we try it, technically. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking as the true analyst now. But there are certain categories where, based upon survey questions, we can have a sense as to whether it's going to work or not. And that's what I think we need to do before we actually set out on this in a certain industry. OK. Um, another question is, what type of limitations would you see with applying this particular method in areas of the world other than North America? Right, yeah. Well, in this case, um, the exact application we had used address information to pull in geodemographics and data was tied to location. Um, in, in Europe, for example, there's certain countries that do that on a, be on a more granular basis than others, like the UK and Spain more so. Um, the European Union, for example, has some statistical areas that they use which are much broader but don't go down to something the size of a block group. <clears throat> so it depends. Um, there are applications um, the, a, a, um, that, that, that can be done through 
uh, satellite tracking. Uh, there was a presentation recently at the SMR conference uh, about that and using satellites to track where uh, vehicles are. That could be used to, to find location data as well. And then probabilities of uh, people being in certain locations having certain, um, you know, um, <clears throat> um, types of behaviors might be a way we could go with that. So there are some opportunities even in lesser developed countries maybe with satellite tracking. Okay. Um, another question. How large does the survey sample uh, size need to be to make the data reliably linked and predictive? Right, yes. Um, I would, I mean, this is just a rule of thumb, but I would say that to really get a decent model, we'd need to have a, at least a thousand completes on the survey. Uh, more is better than less. Uh, we've, we've done it with as few as, you know, six or eight hundred, but the models then, the, the ability to randomly sample uh, tr split a data set into training and test becomes less feasible when you go down to the smaller sample sizes. So rule of thumb, I would say at least a thousand. Okay. And that answer may have bearing on another question we received, uh, which was, do you have any business-to-business uh, -business examples or, or case studies with this, with this technique? So uh, for business-to-business, -business, um, if we have information on the, um, the things like NAICS code and various other things of the business, and the and if the business is a function of of um, if it's a re, if it's a retail business, um, even if uh, that does sell to consumers, but we're selling to that retail business, then we can do surveys based upon the consumer base around the businesses in order to help them um, meet the needs of their consumers better, and that would be a kind of B two B study. But in general, we have to have information about. Um, the firmographics in order to fuse it in. So in any case where we have some firmographic information, we could do studies um, like a conjoint analysis to understand, um, you know, what drives their purchase behavior and then do studies that link uh, firmographic information. All right. And the final question here is, uh, the mapping program that was demonstrated uh, looks very useful. How long did it take to develop? Uh, what kinds of data did you use, and can it be updated? Right. So that uh, we have been working on that area for several years, so we had a head start on that. Um, however, when the data comes in, we can do it rather rapidly now, just because we've we've been doing it for a while. But the the tools were open source tools, um, so in that sense. If you have uh, knowledge of the, in this case, of the R language, um, then that take, took us a long way in being able to develop the tool because <clears throat> in, the, in the applications, the new world of apps, uh, tools are available to quickly put up an app. And there's one called Shiny that we use that, that's the name of the uh, web development tool that uses the R language in the background. And so we use those together to produce the app rather quickly. Um, so it does take a learning curve, but it certainly is something that could be done with someone who has a knowledge of, of some of these open source languages that are available today. And uh, can data that uh, feeds this tool be updated? Sure. Um, is, um, in the case of the American Consumer Survey, for example, it's updated once a year. So as attitudes and preferences change, one would might want to refield a survey, and new data is available on a yearly basis in this case. If you ha have data that is coming in more continuously through digital tracking of, of consumers and then intercepting consumers at certain point to do surveys and ask questions about unobserved things that would not be otherwise available, that can be updated more frequently. So. Uh, in a fast-moving consumer, you know, business world, we might want to update more frequently than a year. But it was certainly refreshing the model is once the data is set up and the models are set up can be something that can be done more quickly than the initial effort. All right. Well, that's all the questions that we received. Thank you very much, and everyone have a good day. 
Thank you, John and Beth, and thank you everyone for attending today's Insider Series webinar. If you have any questions, feel free to email John or Beth. Um, we will have a print version of this presentation along with the notes available in a few days. Um, if you are interested in that, please either email me or John and we can get that to you once it's available. Our next Insider Series webinar will be Wednesday, January 18th. Decision Analyst Jerry Thomas will be presenting on sales forecasting for durable goods. We hope you enjoyed today's session and are looking forward to seeing you for our webinar in January. And have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.